can start. So welcome to the second Academy for Research webinar uh, on data storage in DNA, why and how. We have today two speakers, uh, Marc Antonini and uh, Raja Apuswani. Uh, uh, so Marc received his PhD in electrical engineering in 1991 from Université Côte d'Azur. He was a postdoc at the Centre National d'Études Spatiales, SNES, Toulouse in 1991 and 1992. He joined the I3S Laboratory CNRS in 1993 in Sofia Antipolis. From 1995 to 2001, he was involved with SNES Toulouse in the Earth Observation Program Playad for the definition of the onboard image coder. Uh, since 2004, he is the research director of the Media Coding Research Team. He is also a co-founder of Sin23D, a start startup he created in July 2013, spin-off from University Code d'Azur and CNRS, and specialized in 3D streaming solutions. Today, his title is Archiving Cold Digital Images on Synthetic DNA, is DNA the future of DNA storage? So, thank you, Mark. Okay, thank you, Carol, for, for this introduction. Uh, thank you, Pascal, also, to, to invite me to, to, to give this talk. So, this work uh, has been done in the context of an European project, uh, Olivo Archive. Uh, uh, and uh, the topic is, uh, okay, uh, archiving, archiving called digital images and synthetic DNA. So I would like to start, uh, if I can change my slide. Yep. Okay, so I, I would like to start by this uh, first observation, is that the digital universe, uh, which means uh, all the digital uh, data around the world today, is forecast to grow to over 175 zettabytes in 2025, so in, 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 uh, in four years now. Uh, uh, so 175 zettabytes mean 175 uh, times 10 to the power 21 bytes, which correspond to 1 billion of terabytes. So uh, this quantity is five times bigger than what we have today. And the problem is the storage of uh, this data. For example, if we have to store this data on Blu-ray on Blu disk, for example, we can obtain 20 uh, free stack of disks with uh, uh, a height of uh, the distance Earth to Moon. So uh, we can see that uh, uh, this quantity is very huge and we have some uh, problems for uh, in the future for, for storing uh, such, uh, such amount of data. Uh, sorry. Okay. Uh, However, a, a significant fraction of this data is, is a cold code. So what is a, a cold data? A cold data is an infrequently uh, accessed data. For example, the, your old photographs that you are storing on Facebook and that you never uh, uh, access is an example of cold data. So Facebook is uh, obliged to store the data, but uh, you never access to the data. So, okay, it is something uh, Okay, that, uh, that exists, but that uh, uh, it's not very useful. But uh, it, it must be stored and it must be kept for uh, a long time. So we can uh, make a difference between uh, what we call uh, cold data. So the, let's say that the data delay, it's uh, seconds to hours. So you can wait uh, several, uh, uh, let's say several hours to, 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 got your, uh, to get your data. Uh, on the contrary, when you have a hot data, uh, you you, don't, you you cannot have a delay for accessing the data. So once you want to to access the data, the data the data must be here, uh, uh, depending on the latency, of course, of the network. Uh, Sixty percent. Uh, uh, okay, the rate uh, the, the, the rate growth uh, the rate of growth data growth sorry is sixty uh, percent today which means that uh, each year we increase this data by a, a, a ratio of uh, 60%. And however, if we look at uh, the improvement of in, the rate, in the storage density, uh, this improvement is at best 20% per year. So 
uh, okay, we, we, we face a problem that we don't have uh, enough uh, material for storing the data or we need to increase a lot the material that we need for storing the, the cold data. Also, there is a, a strong problem is that the storage media have a limited uh, lifetime of five years for hard disk drive to 20 years for tape, which means that uh, we have to copy um, each five years the content of a hard disk drive to, 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 to be sure that this content will be preserved the long years. And of course, uh, this creates a waste of material because the old hard disk drive must be uh, uh, we, maybe we can recycle, uh, we recycle it or, or not, but there is a problem of uh, quantity of uh, waste that is uh, produced. So this is not very, very green for the planet. Uh, of course, so people are working on, um, on the solution for, uh, uh, for uh, uh, improving the capacity of storage and also the durability of the material for, uh, for storing. So an example, such an example can be uh, fine in, uh, in uh, the silica glass, which is a project that, which is uh, managed by uh, Microsoft. And the silica glass is a, such kind of, uh, of piece of glass uh, on, on which we can store uh, data in a, in a three-dimensional way. So this storage, for example, in this silica glass, uh, they were able to store uh, uh, the movie of, uh, the, the old movie uh, of Superman, the, the, the first uh, Superman of 1978, uh, which correspond to 70, roughly to 76 uh, gigabytes. Uh, so it was uh, stored on this, uh, on this surface of, or on this volume uh, with a surface of uh, uh, 7.5 by 7.5 centimeter and uh, 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 two millimeters uh, thickness. Uh, okay, so this is interesting because this storage is uh, hard to destroy, so we can keep it so, for several years or even the hundreds of years. The problem that this storage is not very uh, is not yet very compact. This means that uh, storing uh, uh, 76 gigabytes on this uh, volume of uh, of uh, uh, device is uh, not very efficient. So. It's something that is promising, but yet uh, today it's not something that we can uh, uh, you can use. On the contrary, uh, we can. Uh, it, it has been shown that uh, uh, we can store on a single gram of DNA. So uh, I, I think that everybody here know what is uh, DNA. So it has been shown that uh, we can store two hundred and fifty and uh, fifteen petabytes. So 215 millions of gigabytes on a single gram of DNA. Uh, so uh, why, why DNA? Uh, two main advantage for DNA is that DNA is very, uh, it's ultra compact. So uh, as we can see, it, it has been uh, uh, theoretically proved that uh, we can store a lot of uh, a quantity, a, a, a big quantity of digital data on, uh, on a single gram of DNA. And it is a, a material which is very durable because it can last hundreds of seven of years. Uh, for example, uh, we can uh, we can do the sequencing of uh, of uh, uh, old mammoths. So, uh, for example, in this case, it was an old mammoth of uh, forty thousand years old. And also, uh, 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 it was possible to do the sequencing of an old horse bone of seven hundred seven hundred thousand years old. So. It seems that the DNA is uh, something very interesting for doing uh, storage of digital data in terms of longevity and also in terms of, uh, of capacity. The problem is that, uh, okay, today we know how to synthesize DNA, but uh, uh, we can do that at a high price. For example, uh, around $1 for 200 synthetic nucleotides. So uh, this is a problem that we must uh, face uh, on when we want to store data on, on DNA. Uh, so just to, 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 to show the, uh, uh, a parallel, uh, today if we uh, consider a data center, so a data center is, uh, is here, so it's a, a, a huge uh, building uh, uh, containing a lot of, uh, lot of digital data. So uh, if we were able to store uh, digital data into DNA, uh, instead of storing all the data we want to store on this uh, surface and this uh, building, 
we just need the one single gram of DNA, which is represented by this uh, small pixel on the screen. So uh, we can see the power, the, uh, the power of DNA if we are able to store a huge quantity of data on, on, this, uh, on this device. So what's DNA? So <clears throat> of course, uh, you, you know what's DNA. So deoxyribonucleic acid, uh, biological molecule holding information about life. And uh, we have uh, uh, four different monomers uh, that are called nucleo nucleo nucleotides. So uh, 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 adenine, A, thymine, T, cytosine, C, and guanine, uh, G. So from the point of view of uh, computer science, this, uh, let's say this code ATCG can be uh, seen as a quaternary uh, code. Uh, so we, you know, everybody knows there's a binary code. So zero and one, which is a code used by the, by the computers. Uh, here we have another kind of code, which is a quaternary code uh, composed by four, four symbols now, uh, which is of course more powerful than the binary, uh, binary code. And uh, of course, since we have <coughs> uh, something that uh, is able to store a quaternary code like DNA, it is efficient in term of, in term of storage. Okay, we, we, we are not obliged to go from a quaternary to binary, which is, uh, makes no sense. So advanced interfere of biology allows us today to have a, a synthesis uh, of uh, DNA, so writing, and sequencing, so reading, when we want to decode the DNA uh, which was uh, written. So <clears throat> the big question is now how to store digital data into uh, synthetic DNA. And the main workflow uh, is, uh, is the following. So uh, here we have a biological process at the middle and uh, on the sides, uh, right hand side and left hand side, we have signal processing operations. So uh, first of all, what we have to do is to take a signal F. Uh, let's uh, suppose that our signal today is our uh, images. So we have to take an images and to convert these images, which is given in the binary, uh, it's a binary file, it's a digital file, to convert this di uh, digital file into a quaternary code composed by four symbol ATCG. So if we forget uh, the biological process, uh, taking this uh, code ATCG uh, at the decoder side, we are able, thanks to signal processing operation, to recover uh, at least an approximation of the input signal F, the input image, so we can have at the output an image which corresponds uh, in the best case, which is exactly the, the image uh, at uh, the input of, uh, of the encoder. So at the middle, so here it's a signal processing. So we have, a, we create a file uh, containing a sequence of ATCG. So now the problem is uh, how to store this in, uh, in synthetic DNA. So we have to do uh, uh, synthesis, uh, uh, we have to synthesize uh, uh, DNA. Uh, for uh, for uh, storage, and then uh, okay, so it can be uh, stored in some uh, specific capsule that uh, I, I will show uh, later. Uh, and then the day we want to recover uh, our image, we have to do sequencing. So to open the capsule and to to do the sequencing of the synthetic DNA to recover the ATCG sequence that has, that has been uh, encoded here. And then thanks to signal processing to recover uh, 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 the original uh, the input uh, signal we have encoded. Uh, of course, this is not uh, so simple because uh, uh, for example, sequencing introduce errors uh, as well as synthesize and synthesis sometimes. Uh, but uh, okay, so sequencing error is are mainly substitution of nucleotides and the indel, so insertion or deletion of nucleotides which means that uh, we are not able to recover uh, strictly the same code at the output that we have at the input. And so this means that we must find some uh, uh, decoders that are able to correct the error that are inserted in the, in, uh, the decoded uh, sequence. And also to try also to robustify the sequence at the input such that it will be robust to the sequencing noise and also to the synthesis noise. So the basic idea for uh, doing uh, conversion from binary to quaternary is uh, transcoding. So uh, I have uh, a sequence of, of bits uh, here and uh, I use my transcoder. For example, here I can uh, assume that 
the code, the binary code 00, zero is converted in, uh, is coded by A, 01 coded by C, 10 coded by G, and 11 coded by T. Okay, so uh, if I, I, I have this code, okay, I can transcode this binary file and each time I find the 01, for example, I can decode by, uh, encode, transcode by C. So if I want, I have uh, one zero, I can transcode by G and etc. So it's uh, something which is uh, obvious and uh, something which is uh, today the, the, the state of the art for uh, doing uh, DNA, uh, DNA uh, coding. Of course, there are some biological restrictions because if I do such uh, a transcoding, I cannot respect some uh, biological restrictions that are imposed by the biology and uh, by uh, 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 the sequencing process for recovering the data. And uh, what are those uh, biological restrictions? So first one, uh, the first one is uh, the synthesis error. So we know that when we uh, synthesize long strands of nucleotides, uh, errors can appear, and this error uh, increases exponentially with the size of the of the, the, the oligo that we are uh, synthesizing. So the constraint we have today for having a synthesis noise which is uh, very low, uh, very very low, is to to synthesize uh, uh, strands no longer than 300 nucleotides. So this means that we have to do uh, since when I am encoding a signal and let's say an image. Uh, uh, of course, I need more than 300 nucleotides for encoding my, my data, as we will see later in the presentation. So we need to cut uh, uh, our uh, DNA strands into small uh, chunks uh, of size uh, lower than 300 nucleotides and to do some kind of formatting to be able then to reconstruct uh, the full strands after, after sequencing. So these are strong constraints that uh, have a, an impact on the compression ratio that uh, we can obtain. Then we have uh, some uh, uh, noise that is introduced by the sequencing. So uh, first is uh, homopolymer, uh, uh, homopolymer runs. So we, we, we must avoid homopolymer. So for example, a sequence of AAAA or TTTT. We must uh, 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 Generate a GC content which is lower than uh, per, which is lower in terms of percentage than the AT content, and uh, we also must uh, avoid pattern repetitions. So things like uh, ATC, 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 it's something that we are not very good and we want to 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 avoid uh, to be uh, uh, the, the, the more robust as, as possible. So uh, considering those uh, those uh, constraints. Uh, uh, Pioneer, 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 pioneer works, sorry, uh, have been done. And the first one is uh, the work of Church in uh, 20 and, uh, 2012. So of course, the, the, the idea of DNA storage is, is older, but the, the very first attempts that are uh, promising, that were promising, were the, 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 uh, the work of Church in 2012, and which was the, the, the first attempt that uh, practically store data into DNA. And this encoding was very simple. So it was uh, AC, uh, AC uh, give uh, zero and GT uh, give one, or one give AC, uh, GT, sorry, and zero give AC. So of course, uh, this has a low coding potential, but this work uh, allows to uh, define the biological constraints. And the coding potential is very low here. We can see it's one bit per nucleotide. Uh, so there, it generates normal polymer, of course, and the balanced uh, uh, GC. But uh, no error correction was possible. So, uh, or error correction or error detection was introduced in the DNA strand. So, uh, okay, which is not very, very good, let's say, for, for decoding. And this uh, solution was restricted to, to binary input, bin uh, binary input. So, this means that if I have other things that binary to encode, I cannot. So, next in 2013, so uh, the work of Goldman. Uh, so this work allows to have a better uh, compression ratio. So 1.58 bits per nucleotide. So the, the more bits I have per nucleotide, the better, uh, the better it is because uh, I, I increase uh, the compression ratio, okay? So uh, 
Okay, so here uh, we have uh, two advantage uh, compared to church. Uh, okay, uh, there is uh, error correction thanks to a four-fold redundancy, and uh, it's not restricted to uh, binary input. So we can apply this solution for other kind of data. Then the work of grass. Uh, so uh, this work introduced uh, Reed Solomon codes. So it's uh, Reed Solomon codes are error correction code, so which allows error correction after after sequencing, and so the compression ratio was uh, uh, a little bit better than the previous uh, solutions. Uh, the work of Blawat. So it's also uh, something which uh, introduced uh, uh, error correction with uh, Reed Solomon. Uh, so, uh, okay, performance around Grass and, and Goldman. So, and the, the last work uh, is the work of Ehrlich, Ehrlich et al., which is a, today the best solution for this transcoding uh, because he has uh, this algorithm has a high coding potential. We can see that we encode roughly at two bits per nucleotide, which is uh, uh, very good. Tr uh, transcode, let's say, at two bits per nucleotide, which is very good because we are respecting the biological uh, restrictions like no homopolymers and the balanced, balanced GC, con GC content. And there is uh, error detection thanks to the Fontaine code, which allow a, a, good, a good decoding of, of the data. But, uh, okay, uh, it is restricted to a binary, uh, binary input. So this, these are pioneer works uh, today, which correspond uh, as part, of course, of the state of the art. Uh, and uh, okay, today we can say that there, there are not a lot of uh, works on uh, on this topic, but uh, since it is uh, emerging, we there, there are more and more works uh, uh, related to the storage of data on, on, on DNA. <clears throat> so in that context, we propose a, a solution uh, we call the a pair code, uh, which is a low complexity solution uh, and uh, uh, which allows to construct a biologically constrained quaternary code respecting the biological con constraint. And this solution wa wa uh, was uh, patented. So uh, the idea here is to construct uh, a code, a quaternary code, uh, which has uh, what we call a fixed length. So we define the code with, uh, uh, with the code words uh, having a fixed length. And the code words we are uh, constructing uh, are uh, based on the two dictionaries, C1 and uh, C2. And uh, these dictionaries are con uh, constructed uh, in, in order to respect the biological constraints. So we cannot generate uh, by uh, concatenating the symbols of C1, for example, I cannot generate um, uh, homopolymers. And also if I uh, generate code with this, uh, code word with this code, uh, I, uh, respect, I respect the percentage, a low percentage of GC compared to the to 80. So the solution we, we developed is to define a code, uh, 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 code, code words based on the concatenation of symbols from C1 and C2. So if I want a code with uh, a code word with a, uh, even length, I do the concatenation of uh, code words of only the C1 dictionary. If I want uh, code words of odd lengths, then I, after concatenating uh, symbols of C1, I concatenate, uh, concatenate one symbol of C2. So doing so, I am able to construct a code containing several code words. So I can increase the number of code words uh, as I want, and I, ca I can change the length of my, of my code words according to the needs. So if I use uh, this kind of, uh, of code, uh, okay, so let's say first it's uh, robust to sequencing error because we define fixed length code, which are uh, easy to decode in the sense that if I lose one symbol in my code, I, or if I change, let's say, a, a symbol in my code, I know that I have, for example, if my code words have, uh, uh, I don't know, 10 nucleotides, I know that each 10 nucleotides I decode a symbol. So if I uh, make an error in, in uh, among ten nucleotides. Okay, maybe I decode uh, 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 with, uh, not correctly this uh, this code word, but okay, I can jump to the second code word and cor uh, and decode it correctly if there is no errors. So it's very robust to sequencing error. 
Uh, I allow, allow easier error correction, so we, we can uh, we are able to, to, to use some kind of uh, error correction process for uh, doing the decoding. Uh, and also, okay, we can use it in more complex uh, compression schemes than transcoding. Of course, it is less efficient in coding potential than if we uh, have, we can use uh, variable length code, what we call variable length code. Uh, but uh, okay, uh, uh, variable length code, uh, on the contrary, is less robust to uh, sequencing noise. So. Uh, okay, it's a trade-off between robustness and and if, uh, coding efficiency. So uh, our code can be applied to any type of uh, input data, uh, very simple in computational cost, uh, and uh, it contains extra redundancy, but uh, we can exploit this extra redundancy for avoiding pattern repetition. So I, I will not talk about that in, in this uh, talk, but in this presentation, but we, we okay. We, we have this um, uh, possibility to to use part of the code for avoiding pattern repetition. And okay, if I compare the the performance of this code with the state of the art, we we have uh, okay a compression of 1.6 bits per nucleotide, which is roughly comparable to the best uh, the best solution. Uh, we don't have homopolymer. We have a balanced balanced GC content. And we generate no patterns, contrary to the other solutions. We are doing error correction, and we are not restricted to, to a binary input. So we, we are uh, with Goldman, with the solution of Goldman, uh, one of uh, uh, the uh, one of the solution which can be applied to other kind of uh, uh, input. Uh, let's say we can apply this for, to symbols which are uh, not uh, binary symbols. And uh, this is very useful when we have to, to define or to encode uh, images uh, with, uh, uh, with uh, uh, the uh, uh, compression uh, solution that uh, are based on, the, uh, on, the, uh, on the, the classical, let's say, the classical paradigm of image compression. So I, I will present you uh, just after what, uh, what I mean by that. So, okay, in terms of transcoding, we have a, a, a solution which is comparable to the state of the art, even better in some cases. But uh, what we can uh, uh, what we can see is that, okay, uh, what people are doing today, uh, they are uh, taking a binary file, okay, and transcode this binary file into a, a quaternary code. Generally, this binary file, if we are considering images, are coming uh, is coming from uh, JPEG encoding of uh, an input data, which is a, an input image. So we have uh, an encoded image in binary, and then we transcode. If we are doing so, uh, the strand, the size of the strand we are generating with transcoding cannot be controlled. It depends on the size of the binary file we have. So the longer the binary file, the longer the the the, the size of the DNA strands you 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 are uh, you are generating, and so this is uh, not good because uh, we, we we saw that uh, it's uh, generating or synthesizing DNA is very expensive today. So we have to limit the number of nucleotides we want to synthesize. So uh, to do so. It will be more interesting to, uh, instead of transcoding, to, uh, to insert directly the, the, the DNA coding inside the uh, coding, uh, for example, the JPEG uh, coding solution. Because uh, uh, doing so, uh, you can control the trade-off between uh, the cost and the quality of the image you are, you are uh, coding. So, we propose in this context an algorithm that, uh, uh, okay, specific for uh, image storage into DNA, uh, but perform the quaternary encoding by taking into account the nature of the considered data. Uh, so to reduce the cost of uh, the DNA data storage, we employ image compression techniques. And uh, uh, the most important is that we are able to control the compression rate by optimizing uh, the trade-off compression rate, image quality, which is not possible when you are doing transcoding because the, when you are doing transcoding, the image is already encoded uh, in the binary thanks to a JPEG codec with a 
given the quality and then you transcode. Here, the idea is to control the quality of the uh, encoded the image and then to control also the, the, the cost of uh, the synthesis cost. So, uh, if I, I take the, the previous, uh, the previous uh, workflow, but now it's more detailed, so according to what we are doing. So indeed, we are, uh, if you consider the signal processing uh, uh, part of this uh, schema, what we are doing is we are doing uh, some uh, kind of transform of uh, the input image. So uh, this transform is called wavelet transform. So it's a, a spatial frequency transform, which is uh, used in uh, JPEG 2000 codecs for uh, people who know this uh, codec. And then we do quantization of this, uh, of this data. The quantization is optimized thanks uh, to a nucleotide allocation. What we call a nucleotide allocation is uh, something which uh, optimizes the trade-off between the quality of the comparison and the cost of the, the DNA uh, strand which are generated uh, for encoding uh, the quantized data. So this schema is uh, what we call the closed, uh, closed loop uh, compressor because we are not, in that case, we include the DNA encoding inside the, uh, the coder and it is not outside the coder as previously when we are doing transcoding. So we are not uh, encoding in binary and then transcoding in, in, uh, in quaternary, we are directly encoding the data in quaternary. So of course, uh, this data has been uh, uh, then synthesized in uh, DNA oligos, so we, thanks to uh, uh, Twist uh, Bioscience, uh, was stored in, uh, uh, in the DNA shell, uh, and so uh, Imagen imag imag uh, stores the data in the, such a capsule of, uh, of uh, such capsule of DNA shell. And then, uh, working in collaboration with uh, Pascal, uh, we were able to do the sequencing of uh, this data thanks to uh, Illumina. Uh, uh, Illumina uh, sequencing machine. We uh, have done also tests with uh, Nanopore, but I will present on the test on Illumina uh, today. And then thanks to, of course, here at the output, we have a pool of oligos, uh, millions and millions of oligos with noise. And uh, we have to do what we call oligo selection, which like uh, uh, error correction on, the, on, the, on some of the oligos that can be corrected. And then, uh, we do the DNA decoding and the reconstruction with the inverse transform that uh, inverse wavelet transform that allows to reconstruct the the signal uh, the image F. So we did a wet lab experiment so for for that to to verify the feasibility of the storage uh, and or, or, or of course uh, to improve uh, our our uh, encoding solution. So in this experiment, we, uh, we encoded two images of size 128 by 128 pixels with two coding ratio, 2.68 uh, bits per nucleotide and uh, 1.78 bits per nucleotide. So we have two PKSNR here. So what I mean by, by, by this is that if we look here at this uh, schema and we forgot uh, the biological part procedure at the middle, when we are doing a signal processing for compression here, so I have a tar let's say that I, I have a target uh, nucleotide rate. So I say I want to encode my uh, my image F at a given uh, target uh, rate, which was in that case, uh, for example, for one image which was uh, uh, 2.68 bits per nucleotide. So I, I say okay, I want to encode my image at that rate, and then the system here. Uh, uh, optimize uh, the quantization process and the encoding process into DNA to reach this uh, this rate. And then, of course, this has an impact on the quality of the decoded image that I have at the output, because since I am doing compression, it is what we call uh, uh, lossy compression. So I, I, I reduce uh, I reduce the rate of uh, my uh, my uh, encoded signal, but also I introduce some errors in the reconstructed signal. And of course, what we try to do is to optimize this, comp uh, this trade-off. Uh, I want to have the best uh, image quality after decoding for the lowest cost. 
Also, on the contrary, instead of constraining the rate, you can constrain the quality. You can say that I want this quality at uh, decoding, and then the system optimizes the, the, the quantization and the, and the encoding into DNA to reach this, uh, this quality. But, uh, and optimizing uh, always the trade-off between quality and, and rate. But in that case, I cannot control, I can't, can't control directly the, 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 the cost of, uh, of encoding. So here is the reason why the PKSNR we have uh, are the PKSNR after uh, optimizing this uh, um, trade-off uh, rate quality. And this experiment, we synthesized 2,000 oligos. Uh, the synthesis was done by Twist uh, Bioscience, and uh, the capsule were, uh, the, the DNA were uh, encapsulated in DNA shell by Imagen. So, what I was saying previously is that when I am encoding an image, uh, I don't have, uh, uh, I, I have a lot of, uh, I have a lot of nucleotides. Uh, for example, for uh, this image, which is a small size image, we have to generate uh, 662 nucleotide, uh, oligos of size uh, 135 nucleotides, if I remember well. Uh, so the the the, um, the, 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 the 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 DNA strand that I generate, since I cannot uh, synthesize it uh, like it is, I have to to cut it in some chunks uh, and to format uh, the, the chunks. So we we roughly we have uh, such kind of uh, formatting. Uh, which contain uh, at uh, the end uh, primers for uh, being able to do the, the sequencing and some uh, extra uh, information, some extra metadata, uh, mainly uh, uh, headers and uh, offsets that allows to, uh, one, one, once I have decoded my oligos, since I have uh, a pool of uh, oligos of uh, uh, small size, and I have to uh, to bind them to reconstruct the, the whole sequence of uh, DNA for being able to decode my image. I have to insert some offsets, some headers that uh, uh, that allows allows me to reconstruct the, the puzzle. You know, to reconstruct the correct strand for being able to decode. And of course, at uh, inside this uh, this uh, uh, oligo, I have the payload, the, so the, the encoded uh, uh, data, which is important if I want to recover my, of course, my, my, my signal. So each each oligo, we have here some lines, which each line corresponds to an, an oligo, and the, the, the structure is, uh, is uh, the following. So with the primers at the end, the headers in the middle, and then the payload here, which is uh, uh, with high complexity. So we have done uh, the sequencing uh, thanks to uh, Illumina Nexec uh, 500. Uh, okay, so I will not detain uh, this uh, this part. And uh, we were able to to recover the input image as it was encoded. So here we present two kind of uh, two kind of results. If I do nothing after uh, sequencing, so I take the oligos uh, as they are, I uh, decode this. So I take randomly the oligos. I am not able to decode something which is which is correct. Uh, if I uh, select the most frequent oligos, which was uh, uh, a very simple way for uh, for uh, 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 selecting the good oligos, uh, we are able to to decode correctly the two images that were uh, were stored. With the correct uh, PKSNR, so with the PKSNR that we, uh, we uh, that correspond to the to the encoded uh, images. So this experiment was done in uh, 2018, and uh, uh, in 2020, uh, so uh, uh, Pascal uh, uh, tried another experiment with his group, and uh, he decoded the uh, sequencing uh, again uh, the data that uh, were stored, and uh, we can see that uh, again we were able. After two years of, of uh, storage, we were able to to recover um, correctly the, the the images that were stored in this uh, in this uh, in this experiment. So uh, okay, uh, this is uh, okay. I, I just presented a way for uh, for a, a new way for encoding images uh, into uh, DNA. Uh, and we, we start, let's say, uh, we define uh, from scratch uh, an encoder. So our question was also to, 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 to tell what was possible if 
instead of uh, building from scratch uh, 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 an image coder, I use uh, some standard. So, for example, here, if I want to use a JPEG standard, which is 80 percent, today 80% 80 of images on the web are encoded uh, by, by, uh, by JPEG. And when you are taking a picture with your smartphone, you are, you are um, uh, using JPEG. So uh, what happened if we want to, to use this, such kind of, uh, of encoder? So uh, roughly, we, we uh, replace uh, the binary coder of uh, JPEG with uh, uh, our solution per code uh, and a combination, let, let's say a combination of our solution per code and the uh, variable length encoding of, of Goldman. So I will not uh, detail precisely what, what we did, but okay, there is a two, uh, two uh, when, when we are doing the JPEG, uh, we, have, we are using what we call a, a discrete cosine transform to generate high frequency coefficients and low frequency coefficients. Let's say the, the, the average of uh, a block of, uh, an image block of size 8.8. And we have two solutions for encoding the DC coefficients and the low frequency coefficients and the high frequency coefficients, the AC coefficient. So we define, uh, so an in-loop uh, DNA encoding solution in the JPEG uh, standard. So avoiding the generation of the binary at the output of, of, of the JPEG. So this is a closed loop solution also, which allows to generate directly uh, uh, DNA at the output of the encoder. And here, what uh, we can see. So uh, let's let's take a look at the, the, this, uh, those three curves. So uh, if we look at uh, the black curve, the black curve is uh, DNA uh, code inside JPEG. So what I'm just talking about. So introducing a, a DNA code uh, in the JPEG solution, we have this, uh, this, this curve. So of course, for those who are not familiar with this kind of representation, so we, we have here what we call the PKSNR, so the quality here of uh, the image. So the, the, when the, the higher this number, the, the better is the, the quality. And on the x-axis, we have the rates in terms of this nucleotide. So this is, uh, okay, so when we are here on the uh, left uh, right-hand side, we have a high compression ratio and of course, so a poor quality. And when we are on the left-hand side, we have a low compression ratio, but of course, uh, high quality. So the, this is a trade-off of uh, uh, cost, uh, cost quality. Now, if I compare with, with uh, our solution, which is a blue curve, uh, so we are more or less uh, uh, equivalent. So the, what we, we are doing with uh, building from scratch an image encoder with uh, our code per code, or when we are doing uh, a JPEG solution and inserting inside our uh, coding solution, we have a, a similar per performance. Uh, and when we are comparing to transcoding, uh, okay, today transcoding is uh, okay. It's a little bit better, but it's uh, roughly the same, uh, the same as uh, what uh, we are doing when we are inserting directly uh, the DNA code inside the codec. Uh, uh, on the contrary, when we are inserting uh, the code inside the codec, we are able directly to control the uh, rate distortion uh, to control the trade-off rate distortion, which is not possible when we are transcoding. Because if you remember transcoding, you are just uh, taking binary file and the image quality is, uh, is, is given. You cannot uh, uh, optimize this quality and then you, you are just transcoding. So uh, the fact is that if, I, uh, if now I introduce an error inside this, uh, this stream, and here we have, have just inserted uh, one, uh, one deletion in the low frequency uh, subbound in the case of our solution uh, and one deletion in the, in, the, in the file of JPEG or transcoding. Uh, after decoding, uh, it, happened, it happened this. This means what? This means that when we are doing transcoding and if you are losing one nucleotide, you are not able to decode your, uh, your, uh, your data because here you can see that uh, uh, okay, we lose an information and it, it is impossible for the code to resynchronize and to decode the rest. It is roughly, roughly the same thing with uh, JPEG because since we are inserting inside JPEG some kind of uh, variable length code, uh, it appears some, uh, the same thing. So the code is not able to resynchronize perfectly and so we have this kind of effect. Uh, on the contrary, when we are using our solution from scratch with 
uh, a fixed length code. Thanks to the fixed length coding, of course, we are able to resynchronize our code. And if we look at the, uh, the, the image, we can see that there are some errors here. But thanks to the fixed length code, we were able to resynchronize and to decode the correctly the rest of the image. So the solution maybe is uh, a little bit less efficient than others. Uh, or in, in this case, it was uh, roughly the same of uh, JPEG or transcoding, let's say. But in, term of, in terms of rate uh, uh, distortion uh, trade-off, but in terms of uh, robustness, it's uh, very resi resistant to, to the sequencing noise. So uh, just for uh, com to conclude my, my, my talk, so we, we have uh, uh, introduced a new encoding solution for the robust encoding of digital image uh, in, into DNA. And what is interesting is that this solution allows to control the quality cost trade-off. So the quality of my encoded image and the, the cost, uh, I mean the length of the DNA strand I generate for, for encoding uh, uh, the image at a given quality. Uh, one thing very important, it can be uh, applied on any kind of input data format, binary symbols, quantized samples, and it is not restricted to, to binary. So it tackles the problem of biological constraint, of course. And it is, uh, uh, okay, not efficient in terms of, it is efficient, uh, really, it is efficient in terms of rate distortion compared to standard codec. Uh, but, uh, but maybe not so efficient. However, it is less, uh, uh, it, forever it is more robust than uh, to, sequencing, uh, to sequencing noise uh, compared to the, to, the, to the standard codec. So uh, future, uh, future works and ongoing work. So of course we want to improve the coding, the coding performance because this solution will be adopted in the future if it provides some uh, uh, very good uh, uh, rate, uh, uh, very good rate uh, quality trade-off. So we are continuing exploring JPEG solutions, uh, robustifying the, the, the system to sequencing noise, of course, and uh, uh, very important if we want to address uh, the problem of uh, sequencing with a nanopore solution. Uh, we also want to explore joint DNA coding and DNA content-based image retrieval because one of the problem when we have uh, we have stored uh, millions of image into a, uh, a single pool of, uh, or in, in single gram of DNA, let's say. The problem is how to recover your, your data. So you can do some random access, but you also want, uh, you can want to do uh, content-based uh, uh, access. So we have to develop solution for content-based image retrieval, for example. Uh, it would be nice to, to generate longer oligos to, to, to increase the compression ratio and uh, the reduce the cost. And okay, we want to address uh, the nanopore uh, sequencing, which is a solution uh, with a system uh, uh, prone to error uh, more than Illumina. So, uh, of course, this work is, uh, uh, is, uh, is done with collaboration. So I want to thank uh, to my collaborators and uh, especially Pascal and, and, and Raja and uh, my PhD student Eva and uh, my postdoc uh, Melpo. Uh, this work has been done uh, at least in part in the Oligo Archive uh, uh, project, which is an European, an European project uh, uh, with Imperial College, London, Eurecom, CNRS, University Côte d'Azur and Elixworks, uh, a company who is doing, uh, which is doing uh, synth uh, DNA synthesis. Uh, I introduce uh, Raja Abuswami. Uh, he received his, um, uh, in uh, 2007, two uh, Master of Science degrees from the University of Florida, one in agricultural, agricultural and biological engineering and the other one in computer engineering. In 2008, he was a software development engineer uh, for Microsoft company in Seattle. He received his PhD in computer science and engineering from Brazil University of Amsterdam in 2014. And he was a postdoctoral researcher at the Swiss Federal Institute of Technology of Lausanne from October 2014 to December 2017. Uh, now, since 2018, he is an assistant professor at the Data Science Department of Eurocom the Graduate School and Research Center in Digital Science. Today, his title is uh, 
uh, scaling aided similarity computations for DNA storage and beyond. Yes, okay. thank you very much for the introduction, Carol. Can, uh, can you hear me clearly? Yes. Perfect, okay. And can you see my slides now? Yes, we do. Perfect, okay. So thank you very much, uh, Pascal and Carol, for actually having me here. So it's a, it's a pleasure to give a talk uh, here. So uh, today I'm gonna to be talking about uh, scaling edit similarity computations. And this is a problem that's actually, that hit us hard in terms of for DNA storage, but it's also a problem that's very general purpose that uh, it goes beyond DNA storage and it actually applies to many other areas. And I'll give an example of that to the, in the end of this uh, presentation. So this is a, this is this work is a joint collaboration with uh, Eugenio Marinelli, uh, Yi Ching Yang, who are PhD, my PhD students, and uh, Nimisha Chaturvedi, who's a collaborator uh, and in a in a biotech startup here in Sofia. So. Um, I have a few backup slides, but this is going to be a little bit redundant. I'm not going to go over it in a lot of details because you heard all of this from uh, Mark already. So the context of the problem, once again, you know, we are looking at DNA storage. The context is archival data. So Mark explained it very well um, that you know nearly 80% of the data that's generated today is cold. And it, the cold data is increasing at a 60% annual rate. So cold data is growing really fast. And cold data is also being stored longer than 20 years. So this is typically to meet regulatory compliance requirements like legal audits or financial audits and things like that. Um, I have been for a, a huge chunk of my life, I've actually been a storage researcher. So I've actually developed uh, various parts of the storage system. So in Microsoft, you know, Carol mentioned I worked in Microsoft. So I was working on the Windows kernel there. Uh, during my PhD, I worked on the storage subsystem of Minix. It's an operating system based on which Linux was developed. Um, and then in my back again, I went to Microsoft Research um, that, where I actually were, worked on a team that actually built Pelican. So this is a large scale uh, disk based cold storage system, which is used in Microsoft Azure Cloud. So over the course of my lifetime, I've been exposed to many different storage technologies. And uh, we are sort of at an inflection point in storage today because uh, one of the major limitations that storage is facing today is that the density of storage is not growing as fast as the data growth. And a bigger issue is the fact that the lifetime of storage is actually quite limited. So Mark, Mark mentioned this, so I'm not going to go into details, uh, but essentially pretty much almost all storage technologies, conventional magnetic storage technologies, or even flash-based non-flash storage technologies, all of these, they have a lifetime of around 10 to 20 years, right? So the best, longest duration, duration storage that we have today is actually magnetic tape. Uh, tape is a billion dollar industry and uh, it's probably the, the single largest competitor for DNA storage and DNA will have to, DNA storage will have to improve. The cost of DNA has to improve by nearly five to six orders of magnitude, maybe not more, right? It has to improve a lot to actually compete with tape. So tape is extremely cheap today and tape is the leading form of uh, cold storage. And tape usually lasts for about 20, 10 to 20 years. So you, could, you could stretch it for 30 years, but that's about it. So the problem is that now we are at a point where people are starting to gather more data because of artificial intelligence and data science and all this. And companies, whenever they make decisions based on this data, they have to keep this data for a long time period, right? So you decide something based on the data and 50 years later, somebody comes and sues you. You need to have the data to prove that the algorithm that you ran produced the result, right? Or to actually prove to them whatever, right? So there are legal requirements that force companies like banks or insurance companies or pretty much any company that works with uh, customer data to protect this data and save this data for long time periods. And if you look at a normal human lifetime, right? So we are all, it's already like, you know, life expectancy is increasing. So you need to have, if you're looking at patient data, you need to store it for 60, 70 years, maybe 80 years, right? Until the patient is gone. Uh, so clearly we need to store data for a bit longer and longer time periods. And now the issue is that given the limited lifetime of the storage devices, the major problem in storing data for long time is that every few years you actually have to refresh your data, right? You have to move from one generation of storage to another generation. And this is going to be, this is the killer. This is actually the single most expensive operation when it comes to data archives. And perhaps this is a very good example uh, of the problem is from an article by Marty Perlmutter. So I'm putting it here so that, you know, you guys can go and look it up. So in Hollywood, they have this problem that they need to archive movies, uh, which have been made uh, for since a long time. And now movies are being shot in 4K, 4K resolution and each movie is several terabytes in size, right? And so you have this requirement now that Hollywood archives would like to preserve movies and guess what technology they're using for this. They are using tape. 
And it turns out that they have to renew, they have to migrate their data from an old version of tape to a new version of tape every five to seven years to keep up with the tape technology. And this is costing them millions of dollars. So at a point, they are already at a point now where they are saying that we cannot do this forever. So what, what they have decided is they are not going to be archiving all, uh, well, not all movies, it's, it's impossible, but they're not even going to be archiving many independent uh, movie productions. Right, so movies that are not very popular, movies that are not that do not have a huge fan base, they are not going to be archiving uh, movies from independent film producers, and so this is kind of uh, basically creates a black hole. And they, we've kind of said that you know this is creating kind of a black hole in the movie industry where there will be a period since after 1940s and 1950s when there will be a lot of movies that were generated but they were simply not stored. Right, so you might actually ask, why do I care if the movies are not stored? Right. Um, this problem is actually coming to the enterprises. So what we are actually seeing is if the rate at which people are gathering data is going to keep growing at today's pace, very soon every company will have to rethink how is it going to store data over long time periods. Okay, so that's the problem. And here is just a very quick pitch for DNA storage, right? So Mark already mentioned this. So the reason why we are looking at DNA storage is because among other reasons is the fact that it's incredibly dense. So it's about eight orders of magnitude denser than tape even looking at the most optimistic projections for tape. So density is very, very good. It's very durable. We know that, you know, here's an experiment, exper uh, we know by experience. So here's an example from the team from Jar Church, uh, where they actually dug up the fossils of woolly mammoth. So this is a species of animal that lived about 5,000 years ago in Siberia, I think. So they dug up the fossils, extracted the DNA, and they tried to use gene editing techniques to actually uh, change an elephant's DNA to, cre to recreate the woolly mammoth. Now, um, this clearly shows you that it's possible to extract DNA even in such short sleep conditions, right? So if you preserve DNA using DNA shell, for example, as Mark showed you, DNA can last for several thousands of years without any problem. And so we have this uh, European Union project called the uh, called Oligo Archive. Uh, it's, a, it's a future and emerging technologies project where we are trying to look at using, what are the problems in using DNA as a digital storage medium? Uh, and particularly we are focusing on archival storage, right? So this is the context. Okay. So now I'm just going to summarize an overview of how DNA data archival works. Mark already summarized this, but I'm going to summarize this so that I can tell you what part of this uh, you know, process we are going to focus on in the stock, right? So the typical process by which this works is you, you take an image, you take some binary data, whatever it is. So here, for example, I'm taking Uricom's logo. You encode that using an encoding algorithm. Mark talked about this in a, in a lot of detail. For this talk, we are not going to focus on encoding at all. Okay, so we're going to assume any encoding algorithm. Could be Mark's encoding algorithm, could be something else. Ultimately, you convert this binary data into a sequence of um, oligonucleotides, so a sequence of uh, DNA strands, right? And then you are going to synthesize this DNA uh, to generate the actual uh, DNA strands that's going to come to you in one of those capsules that Mark was showing. And when you need to read the data, need to read the data back, you are actually going to use sequencing, as Mark mentioned. And sequencing is going to read the read out the sequence of uh, nucleotides in your DNA and report back to you. Now, what's interesting is that um, when you sequence the DNA, you do not get what you store originally. So, in the example here, I'm showing you. Suppose we stored converted the data into these three different DNA strands or three different oligos, right? When you sequence it back, you might get multiple repeats of each oligo. You, some of these oligos might be left out and some of these oligos might be repeated multiple times, right? And you might get errors. So you might get uh, insertion and deletion errors uh, where a nucleotide can be inserted or a nucleotide can be removed. And you can also get substitution errors where one nucleotide can be replaced for the other. So here in this example, I'm showing you that the, the, the blue oligo has been replicated three times. The green oligo is replicated twice. You see there are errors in both and the purple oligo is completely left out, right? Now we also have the problem that what you store in the, uh, what you store this nice sequence of oligos, what you get back is this jumble, right? There is no ordering, absolutely no ordering at all. So imagine you're trying to read from a disk where you have no information about the ordering. There is no clear numbers, uh, numbered sequences, zero, one, two, three, and so on, right? So you have to figure out a way to put this back together in the original order to reassemble the original strings from this uh, jumble, this set of noisy uh, reads that you have from sequencing, okay? That's the process that does this. It's actually called the consensus process, the read consensus process. The goal of this process is to recover back the original strings, as I told you, using these reads, okay? 
and then you can take these strings pass them to decoding to recover back your original file now as i mentioned some of these strings might be missing right so here you see the purple strand is missing it's the job of the encoder to add enough redundancy so that you can recover back the data even if some of these oligos are missing okay so we are not going to worry about that what we are going to worry about is the fact uh, that is the question of how to recover back original strings whatever is that how do you recover it back from the set of noisy reads which are which have a lot of errors right so that's the problem that we are looking at and this is the consensus problem why is this consensus problem so complicated so as i mentioned for cons to do consensus we have to start from noisy reads okay what you need to do is you need to do something that's called a, you need to do find, do edit similarity so i told you that these reads are actually copies of the original oligo and these copies have errors right so they can have in insertion and deletion errors or indels in short and they can have substitution errors so to simplify the problem you can think of these reads as strings okay so you have one set of strings which are your original strings now you have another set of strings which are actually copies of the original with errors in order to find out what the original strings are what you need to do is you need to compare every single string with every other string here okay and you need to compare them to see which strings are similar to each other so that you can group them together right so this is similar this is what we call a similarity join in a database okay where you are comparing a table you are joining a table with itself trying to find out everything that's similar to each other the thing here is that because you have indel errors you can have insertions and deletions the distance metric that you use for comparing the strings needs to be something that's called the edit distance or a levenstein distance that's the number of substitute the, the number of insertions deletions or substitutions that you can make to one string to change it into another string okay so basically you use the distance metric to compare strings then using this distance you find out all the strings that are within a particular distance of each other and you cluster strings that are similar to each other okay so that's what you're doing here that's the next step where you cluster the strings that are similar to each other and finally once you have your clusters you can simply go to each cluster and you can form a consensus right so you can say okay in this cluster i have these strings so you can look position wise now and you can say okay these three strings the first character is an a second character is a c third character is a t and you can keep doing this and you can build one consensus string for each cluster and once you have done this you have your uh, consensus strings that you can pass to the decoder now so this is the process that actually goes on inside the read consensus problem why is this a problem the issue is that what we get back from the sequencer the noisy reads you get 100 million to several billion strings okay the sequencer today sequencer if you sequence dna at, uh, at you know even 10x 20x 30x depth you actually get multiple repetitions of each string and remember that in a single dna pool you, in a single pool you can actually store millions of strings copies of millions of dna strands each dna strand will be amplified 10 20 30 times so you're looking at hundreds of millions of strings that come out of the sequencer okay and you have to take these billion strings you have to do this edit similarity join okay now the second problem is that computing edit distance between two strings alone itself is a very complex operation it requires the use of dynamic programming and it's a it's a quadratic complexity so what we call a quadratic complexity meaning it's the time taken is proportionate to square of the length of the two uh, length of the strings right so it's a very computationally intensive operation if you just take two strings now imagine you have 1 billion strings you need to find 1 billion times 1 billion pairs and do edit similarity right so this is going to be a non scalable operation it's computationally extremely intensive you can simply not do it if you do it you will end up running this just this edit similarity the first step you will run it for a week or maybe even more on a large cluster okay and then the second stage the clustering and consensus once you have done edit similarity clustering and consensus you do it only on smaller subsets you do it on 1 million strings so these are your original strings that you have recovered so really the problem if you look at it and you focus on it is this first stage right is the first edit similarity stage where you have to find out all strings that are similar to each other so this is the problem that we actually set out to solve and what we built was a new algorithm that we call one join okay so the idea of one join is to bring together concepts from two three different domains so the first domain that we are looking at is theoretical computer science so from theoretical computer science recently there have been some advances where they have introduced this concept of low distortion embedding okay so the idea of embedding is to take a set of strings and you change them into another set of strings so that's why it's called embedding so you embed them into another set of strings such that 
if you have to use edit distance for comparing strings in the original set, so in this case, I'm using edit distance for comparing strings in the, in the set on the left, you can, instead of using edit distance on the original set, you can use hamming distance on the strings in the right, the embedded strings, okay? Now, why do you want to use hamming distance? The computational cost of hamming distance between two strings is linear in the length of the string. It's, if you have a string of length n, the computational cost is order of n. Whereas for edit distance is order of n square, as I told you, right? So computationally, hamming distance is much, much, much simpler than using edit distance. And what this recent advances in theoretical computer science have shown is that by using these embedding, randomized embedding algorithms, if you embed these strings and use hamming distance, if you take two strings in the original set, okay, with the edit distance e, in the embedded set, the same two strings in the embedded set, once they have been embedded, the hamming distance of these two strings will be less than square of the edit distance. So the reason why I'm telling this net net, what you have to remember is that you can basically embed the strings from the original set into the new set, okay? Such that if two strings are close to each other in edit distance, they will also be close in hamming distance. So what you're doing is you're replacing one distance with another distance without losing basically the property that, you know, with the, while preserving the, the closeness of the strings or the closeness of the distance, right? So that's what embedding does. So this is the first thing that we actually use from, uh, from the theory of, uh, from computational, sorry, from the theoretical computer science. That's, that's been recently advanced. The second thing that we use is, uh, comes from uh, uh, algorithmics. The second technique that we use is what's called locality sensitive hashing, okay? The idea of locality sensitive hashing is to take a bunch of strings and then you build a family, use a family of hash functions to separate out these strings into different buckets such that the probability of two strings being similar within a bucket is very, very high. Okay, so think of it as this way, you take the set of strings and then you use a set of hash functions. I won't go into details about the hash functions here, but you use a set of hash functions which essentially assigns each string to a different bucket, okay? And the, the hash, functions, hash functions are chosen in such a way that if two strings fall in the same bucket, the probability of them being similar to each other is very, very high than if you take two strings in two different buckets. Now, the reason why we are able to use locality sensitive hashing is because of the fact that it is hash functions are very well defined for hamming distance, but they are not well defined for edit distance. So now we have the second benefit of using embedding to convert edit distance into hamming distance, because now we can apply locality sensitive hashing to cluster the strings into buckets based on hamming distance instead of using edit distance. Once you have applied locality sensitive hashing, now with, you can go within each bucket and you can apply edit distance to strings within the bucket, okay? Because now you have taken 100 million strings, you have separated it out into 1 million buckets, okay? And within each bucket, you have only 100 strings. Now you can go ahead and you can do full-blown edit distance, even if it's n square, you're doing it only for 100 strings. You're not doing it for 100 million strings, right? So you can do full-blown edit distance to make sure that you get only those strings that are really similar in terms of edit distance. And then you output the, uh, the pairs that are similar to be used for clustering. So this is actually the core of one join algorithm. So we use concepts from theoretical computer science, algorithmics, and bioinformatics, which is essentially the, fact, the concept of using edit distance for comparing strings, right? So we combine all these things together into one technique, one algorithm, which provides scalable edit similarity join. Now we don't stop that. You can run this algorithm on a CPU, okay? But if you look at modern hardware, if you look at a modern uh, machine, usually you have, it's very diverse in terms of processors. So modern machines have CPUs. Many of you might have heard of graphics processors like GPUs, which you might have used for gaming. Uh, these are very good at vector calculations. And some of you might have heard of uh, field programmable gate arrays. These are actually uh, hardware processors that you can actually program at a much lower level than the GPU, okay? And these are very good at doing spatial computations. It has always been up until now, up until just one year or two years ago, a uh, few years ago, let's say, it's always been the case that if you have, if you want to use these different processors, let's say you want to run a program on a CPU or you want to run a program on a GPU, you had to use different programming languages. You had to use different runtimes, different libraries and different tool chains. There was no uniform uh, programming framework across all these platforms. Recently, Intel announced one API which is an open source and uh, data parallel C++, uh, which is a key component of an API. This is an open source implementation of what's called SICL. SICL is an industry-wide standardization effort 
to define cross-platform data parallelism support for C++. So basically, SQL extends standard C++ programming language with certain key data parallel constructs. And one API actually uh, provides an open source compiler for, for SQL like code and extends it further. Okay. So uh, what I can't go into too many more, I can basically give an entire lecture about one API and DPC++ here, but given that this audience is probably not interested in this, um, I'm not going to go into details, but essentially today one API and DPC++ are being, uh, is being investigated and being used uh, for high performance computing applications. Um, you know, particularly like molecular simulations, weather predictions, things like this, and also for machine learning, very various machine learning tasks. And the idea of this is that you write, you use C++ to actually write certain key data parallel kernels, okay? Some code that you actually write in a spe special variant of C++ that's called DPC++. And then you can compile this code to target different program, to, to target different processors. So you can take the same code and with some modification, you can make it to run on a CPU, a GPU, or an FPG. Okay. So what we have done is we took the one join program that you saw earlier. So you have embedding, locality sensitive hashing, and verification. We took these key stages and we have implemented them in DPC++ as key kernels. Okay. And by doing so, what we achieve is we achieve cross architecture parallelism because we are now able to run this code on both CPUs and GPUs. And we get cross vendor parallelism. So we are able to run it on Intel GPUs. We are able to run it on NVIDIA GPUs. We're able to run it on integrated GPUs that are sitting on your seat on the processor die and discrete GPUs that, that are sitting attached to the PCIe bus, which you go and buy normally from a shop, right? So we have all this parallelism. So if your machine has a GPU, it's very likely that we will be able to exploit, exploit it uh, with, with uh, one join. I'm just gonna, just give me one second. Yeah, sorry about that. I think I got a call. Uh, so, the, so basically, this what we have done is essentially implementing one join with uh, DPC plus plus and one API, and um, we also use one TBB, which is a threading library for exploiting uh, code on the CPU side. Okay, so this is basically we have done implemented all of this, and that's all. I will leave it there. I'm not going to go, go into any more details about the the uh, algorithm. And what I want to show to you today is just some uh, preliminary evaluation of uh, how this can work, what benefits you can actually get. So first I'll show you, I will evaluate the join alone. Okay, so I'm not going to look at the, the DNA storage part. So let's look only at the join algorithm alone and compare it with state of the art joins. For this, we'll use a, a data set, which is a, which we refer to as the genomic data set. So we actually took the chromosome 20 uh, from GRCS37 reference genome. And we divided it up, chopped it up into 470,000 strings of length 5,000 characters, okay? And uh, the goal is to basically take this data set, we modified it, we added some, uh, you know, copies to it and some edits to it. And then the goal is to actually find out from a data set how many strings are similar to each other. This is a very standard data set that's used in the database community. So it might not be used in the bioinformatics community, but it's used in the database community for evaluating join algorithms. And we evaluate our, um, uh, our algorithm on both the Intel Dev Cloud, so this is a cloud offering from Intel, and using a local server which is equipped with uh, NVIDIA GPU. So notice here that we have the Intel GPU here, which is iGPU, which is typically on your laptops, and we have uh, an NVIDIA GPU, which is a server-grade GPU situated on our server. Okay, so we have different GPUs from different vendors of different types. Okay, so if graph here, the first graph here shows you just an isolated view of the embedding kernel. So we, I told you the first stage of the embed join is embedding. What you see here is um, we compare our algorithm one join with uh, a state of the art algorithm called embed join. Okay? And what, what I want you to take away from here is that we can actually run one join on a Xeon processor. This is a CPU on an integrated GPU and on a multi-core Xeon CPU, so six-core CPU, right? So we can basically scale on multiple different types of hardware. And what you also see here is that as you go from a, a CPU to an integrated GPU, we get about 14-fold improvement in performance. And when you go from a single CPU to a six-core CPU, you get a 27-fold improvement in performance. And I have to emphasize here, the interesting aspect here is the fact that we have written the algorithm using DPC++, uh, the programming language and programming framework, right? And uh, by carefully crafting this algorithm, we make sure that with minimal code changes, we are able to achieve, exploit all these different architectures. Right, and I'm showing you once again here, an extended version of the previous evaluation, but this time we are actually using 
uh, what we are using here is a 12 core CPU and the NVIDIA GPU. Okay. Notice once again, by simply compiling the program to a different uh, processor in the NVIDIA GPU in that case, we are able to exploit the parallelism of the NVIDIA GPU just as the way we were able to exploit it with the Xeon CPU, right? So you see here the range of processors that we are using and in net net, what we see here is that compared to the state of the art algorithm in the database community, Embed Join, we are 113 times faster uh, by using one join for, uh, for embedding, right? And here I'm showing you the end-to-end uh, -end execution of the join algorithm. So this is not just the embedding phase, but the end-to-end -end execution, which includes the locality sensitive hashing and verification. And end-to-end, -end, we are about 20 times faster than the database join. So that was a very quick overview of just the join. I want to now look at, let's now look at the DNA storage part. So back in 2019, Mark mentioned this, we synthesized some DNA. So we took a Postgres database. This is a very popular open source database. We dumped the data from Postgres and we actually converted it and stored it on DNA. Uh, Pascal actually provided resequence this data with Illumina uh, and they provided, a, uh, provided us with reads. So we have about 5 million reads. Each read is about uh, 209 uh, nucleotides long, let's say. And from this, we apply uh, one join uh, to these reads uh, using the NVIDIA GPU. And we are able to process these 5 million reads in five minutes to separate out and find out all possible pairs of strings that are similar to each other. We feed these similarity strings to a modified version of DB scan clustering algorithm, which is programmed so that uh, the clustering algorithm takes as input all possible strings that are similar to each other and then finds out the clusters uh, in those strings. Uh, and this takes less than one minute. And as I told you, the key bottleneck is actually in computing the similarity, right? It's not on the clustering itself. Then we take a consensus in each cluster to produce a, a, a consensus representative string and we pass that to the decoder to recover back the data. So using this full setup, what we saw was that the end-to-end -end decoding, basically we were able to do it in minutes using one join. And the state of the art before this, we used to use star code for clustering strings. And if we run star code on this data set, it takes several hours. So last I remember it took more than 10 hours to actually run the same algorithm because computing star code does exhaustive edit similarity computations. And doing exhaustive edit similarity at 5 million strings, it's just way too much, right? So you don't want to do that. So uh, to conclude, one join really scales well due to uh, the, the algorithmic aspects like embedding LSH, and also due to DPC++ and one API, where we are able to exploit CPUs and GPUs simultaneously. Uh, and DNA read clustering scales very well due to one join as I showed you. So one join was actually developed on Intel DevCloud as I showed you, and uh, it was actually recognized as a cross architecture challenge winner recently. So one join was uh, um, advertised by Intel and we have actually given talks on Intel, uh, invited talks in Intel's um, Dev Summit events. Uh, but what I want to conclude here is by saying that the embedding that we use in one join, the fundamental algorithm of embedding is not, is not limited to DNA storage. It's actually applicable to other problems also. A very good example of this is a, a sequence aligner called Axel Align that we have developed recently that uses a new technique called seed, embed, and extend uh, for aligning sequences. So for those of you, I'm sure many of you in the audience actually know about sequence alignment, but for those of you who are not aware, the typical workflow when it comes to analyzing a genomic human genomic data is to take the reads um, that you get from a sequencer. So you sequence the human genome, so the DNA of a, a patient, for example, then you align that uh, the reads that you get to a reference genome. That's the first starting point so that you can actually call variants and see what in your genome is probably contributing to a particular disease, right? So the, this first stage alignment is quite computationally intensive because as you can imagine, once again, it relies on edit distance. Okay. And what we have built is we have used embedding once again to develop a new aligner called Axel Align. And um, uh, we, what we have, what I'm showing you here is a table where we are compiling, comparing Axel Align to three state-of-the-art aligners, BWMM, Bowtie 2, and Minimap. And for uh, the bioinformaticians in the audience, you will, all of you will be, will know about this, I'm sure. And what we see is we get about three to 12 times sp speed up over the state-of-the-art aligners. And I should mention here that Axel Align is not developed using DPC++, okay? So it's developed using just plain normal C++. So it runs only on CPUs. And just on CPUs, normal CPUs, we achieve a tenfold improvement compared to state-of-the-art aligners, which is already a big deal because many GPU-based aligners achieve that much. So we are already on par with GPU-based aligners right now, okay? 
And accuracy wise here, the table shows you the accuracy on a real data set, which is from uh, the genome in the bottle uh, consortium. So we have uh, the GAAB truth set of variants. And what we see here is the accuracy is very close. We're able to pick out both SNP variants and indel variants very, very accurately uh, using our aligner. And uh, uh, axle align, both axle align and one join are simply the tip of the iceberg, right? So I think there are many, many possible applications that are, uh, that are out there and that we can apply like graph alignment or sequence assembly or mode identification. And uh, we are really open for collaboration. If any of you in the audience would like to actually, you know, use our aligner or use our reclustering tool or work with us on one of these other problems, I'd be more than happy to actually talk to you guys. So having said that, I would like to conclude my talk and, you know, we can go to questions. Thank you. Thank you, Raja. Uh, if, uh, Thank you, Raja. Yeah. Uh, as we are not a lot of people, uh, pr probably the, the best would be to, to ask directly the, the question, if you have. Um, so uh, thank you uh, to both of you for, for this uh, beautiful presentation. Uh, I, I, uh, I'm not objective uh, at, at saying that, but uh, this is your work. <laughs> <laughs> That's uh, very impressive. Uh, the, uh, regarding uh, Axel Align, mm -hmm. have you uh, um, have you looked at uh, different quality of of, uh, of sequences to see exactly uh, how it was working? Because it it, it, it is probably important to to have uh, more evidence that uh, it, it works in different situations. Yes, indeed. So that's something that we are actually looking at right now. So the, the GAAB truth set, uh, we take the data set that's available to us from G the Genome in the Bottle Consortium. Uh, but we are actually looking for other data. Uh, so we have worked with simulated, so one thing I should say, we have worked with simulated data uh, from generated by Mason or by other very popular read simulation tools. And we have uh, tested wide range of errors and wide range of uh, sequence qualities and it works very well. But we also want to test it with real life data. So in case Pascal, if you do have some sequences that are bad quality, for example, I would very much like to actually test Axel Align on those. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. I, I, I know that uh, the, the big, big centers uh, uh, in Avery or in Pasteur, et cetera, have a lot of different uh, genomes that mm -hmm. are uh, working with. Okay. And uh, they represent interesting uh, uh, variation with different GC content or uh, different type of sequences. Mm -hmm. So that, that can probably be uh, interesting to, 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 to enter into contact with them and to test yeah. uh, their genomes. Absolutely. Yeah. I mean, if you, if you know, if you could point me at some, some people, yeah, that yeah, would be sure. great. Yeah. Mm -hmm. That'd be wonderful. Mm -hmm. Is there any any question uh, from the audience? And Mark, uh, um, what, what is your um, your view uh, about the uh, well, um, the, the, this new type of encoding? What is the potential of that? And do you think that uh, we we can imagine new new way of, of uh, uh, analyzing uh, the information with that, or uh, is there anything that was not uh, was would become possible with a, a quaternary code that was not possible with a binary code? This is a good question, uh, Pascal. <laughs> um, okay, C certainly we can have a new application using uh, directly DNA for doing computation and things like that. Um, I'm not really, really aware of, about all the possibilities, but uh, uh, I guess there are a lot of possibilities with DNA. Uh, con concerning storage, because it's uh, my, uh, uh, my, my field of research, uh, I, I think that it's uh, maybe one of the future of uh, storage will be DNA. Uh, maybe we will not be able to to store all the data and to, to, to in, into DNA, and we for sure we will keep a binary solution uh, jointly with uh, with DNA. But in some specific case, I guess for uh, cold data especially, I guess that uh, DNA would be a, a good uh, a good candidate for for doing that. 
uh, and so the quaternary code, uh, of course, DNA is a, is a, is a uh, let's say a, 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 a media that allows to store uh, the quaternary di code directly. So it's uh, uh, it's something that uh, it's interesting for that. Maybe in the future with other polymers, uh, there are research uh, uh, on, on this topic. Maybe we can have uh, other solutions that are. Uh, uh, that can use uh, uh, more than four uh, uh, four symbols for encoding the information, uh, and maybe they will be more powerful uh, again. So, uh, but for for today, what is interesting with DNA is that uh, since uh, 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 people will be always interested in uh, sequencing DNA in the future, uh, there will be always sequencing machine doing doing, doing this separation. So it will be something that will remain. It will remain possible to, to decode uh, DNA in, uh, in 100 of years, uh, for, for sure. Mm -hmm. So I'm not sure that I respond correctly <laughs> to your, to your no. question, uh, Pascal. But, uh, okay. And uh, I, I had also another question regarding the compression ra ratio. Yes. Uh, you, <laughs> you talk about the encoding and you, you showed that uh, uh, people were going at uh, up to two bits per, per, uh, per right. nucleotide. But uh, in that case, you are considering all the extra sequences that are necessary to process the DNA. I yeah, mean, um, all the extra sequences are important and they represent a, a very yeah. a, a major fraction of the signal, by the way. Yeah, yeah, of course. Uh, in in uh, in general, when we are uh, when we are uh, computing the, the the compression ratio, we include everything. So we include all the extra information, the meta the metadata that we need for decoding, of course. But we can also uh, express the the, the, the net uh, compression ratio without uh, by avoiding all of. Uh, uh, of this extra information, but uh, if you to be, to be honest, when when you have to to, to define a compression ratio, you must take into consideration this. So when we we uh, announce some uh, compression ratio, for sure we we have to 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 consider um, this extra information. Uh, to, what is important to see is that these two bits per nucleotide, for example, is when I consider the input uh, bit stream which is transcoded into quaternary. So the reference is the bit stream that I have at the input of the transcoder. But uh, we must not forget that this bit stream comes from a compression of an input signal. Mm -hmm. and generally, when people are uh, in, 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 in compression domain, in coding domain, when people are evaluating the compression ratio, they are considering the number of bits of the input data. Mm -hmm. Okay. so. When I, uh, I, I talk about transcoding, the number of bits per nucleotide is uh, only considering the bit stream after uh, encoding because I don't know the data uh, which was encoded. And when I show my PKSNR, my quality rate curve, I am considering the, in, the input data. So the image that I, that I am encoding. So, uh, and, and this is, I guess this is something which is a, a problem today because we have these two solutions, transcoding and, uh, and uh, uh, coding directly into quaternary, uh, considering the, the nature of the input data that you are encoding. And uh, uh, most of the companies today uh, are pushing the transcoding solution, like a Twist or uh, uh, Microsoft. They are pushing the transcoding solution, uh, uh, telling that, okay, data is already in binary, so we, we have to transcode. So, okay. Uh, so uh, then uh, the compression ratio that we, we can estimate is just considering the binary data as, uh, as a source, as input file, and then uh, converting in, in quaternary. So we reach a uh, base case, the two-bit nucleotide. When we are uh, doing uh, uh, compression, considering the nature of the source, as we are doing, because we consider uh, our image, the compression ratio is estimated from the, the source data. So it's classical in compression. And then we can reach a uh, higher compression ratio in reference of the source data. Now, there is two, these two solutions that are, are existing today. And this is also, we, we are discussing that in the JPEG uh, DNA uh, uh, committee, the ad hoc group of JPEG, which because uh, uh, people in the standardization are interested in uh, 
in uh, maybe defining one day a standard for uh, coding uh, images onto DNA. So this is discussed uh, cur uh, currently in this uh, committee because we have uh, uh, we have these two uh, solutions and maybe they will coexist in the future. So it's uh, complicated when we, we want to, for us even it's complicated when we have to compare with state of the art because people are providing the rate uh, according to transcoding but we are not transcoding and we are considering the source data. So, okay. Uh, it's uh, okay, so it's uh, it's difficult, but uh, uh, in, in anyway, uh, there is no uh, uh, strictly speaking in terms of uh, from a, uh, uh, from a guy from a compression uh, uh, domain, we should consider the, the nature of the input and the quantity of bits input uh, required for computing the compression ratio. Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay. Thank you. My, my point of view. <laughs> Is there any other uh, uh, questions that, uh, from the audience? Or? So, uh, thank you very much for, for the two presentations and the, and the discussions. And uh, so, yeah. thank you. see you Perfect. soon. Thanks a lot, yes. And Pascal and Mark, see you in a few days. Yeah. Bye bye. Thank you, everybody. Bye bye. bye. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.